Hey guys, it's LO from Low Altitude and Aviation Lowdown. Thanks for joining me on another fun-filled video from very rainy Long Island, New York. And as I said to somebody earlier, thankfully it's not snow. Here in December, we're kind of getting lucky here. But I'd like to talk to you guys about something I've got numerous questions on. The FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, is hiring air traffic control specialists, or they're going to be, January 24th, 2020, and this was made public by some of my friends in NATCA, the National Air Traffic Controller Association, that's the union for ATC, air traffic control. So I'd like to take a few minutes to describe to you guys some questions I get, what this means, what the job's about, how you can apply, and perhaps, you know, maybe encourage you to do so if you're interested. We'll talk about it. So thanks guys, as always, if you like this video, please subscribe, please comment. So air traffic control, these are the guys who are not on the ramp with Juan, so the numerous people, especially myself over the years, have alluded to that. But no, they're actually the guys and gals who are in control towers, they're in radar facilities, they're the people who keep air traffic safe. They keep it, well, separated. They keep it, the system that is, running smoothly and efficiently. A little bit about me, I actually was an air traffic controller in training. I left the job so I can make stupid videos like this, but no, I'm kidding. By being involved in ATC memes as well as the pages today and my experience within the industry itself, I feel that I've gotten a pretty interesting look at what this job entails, what it's about, maybe describe to you some common questions I get. And as always, if you have questions yourself, email me, lo at aviationlowdown.com. Let's talk about this thing. So air traffic control is a niche position. There's really not many jobs in the world like it. You're dealing with airplanes, you're dealing with pilots, you're dealing with weather, you're dealing with routing, with the whole system. You have a big responsibility. Your primary job is to keep airplanes from crashing into each other. But you're also responsible for things like keeping the system efficient, keeping the system flowing, and in reality, it's a massive responsibility. One of the questions I constantly get pertaining to air traffic control is a question maybe you're wondering yourself, and I think it's been perpetuated by media, by news, by Hollywood, which, by the way, some of the movies are actually pretty entertaining. I think on the set of that movie is where Billy Bob Thornton met Angelina Jolie, by the way. But no, the question is, is air traffic control stressful? My answer, as adding to my disclaimer that, you know, it's only limited by my subjective experience and my opinion, but the answer is, it depends. Number one, stress is cyclical in air traffic control. That is to say, you're not always going to have the same workload when you're quote-unquote on position. Uh, and number two, and perhaps more enlightening, stress is not created equal, and it's certainly not equal amongst different people. There is a certain element of uh, personality that goes into the skill set of an air traffic control specialist. And I can really describe it as people who sort of get in the zone when they're thrown into chaos. This is the best way I can describe it. One of the classic scenes I often think about is that of a combat medic where the enemy's firing at you and your other allies and soldiers and your job is to basically penetrate into the chaos, do what you have to do, and maintain a razor-sharp focus during that, uh, that environment. Now, clearly there's no physical harm to you while working traffic, but the mental clarity required to work under a high-pressure environment is exactly the same. There are really two big parts of air traffic control that, in my opinion, are what give it that notorious stressful label. Number one, Air traffic control is a job that deals with the immediate situation at hand. While it's true training takes a while, you'll be studying and memorizing things, the reality is that the majority of the job happens in real time. These are real decisions that have to be made at a moment's notice, usually. So right off the bat, that turns people off because sometimes people feel that they don't have the intuition or the mental capacity or they just don't trust themselves enough to be able to work in an environment that requires them to be totally on their game in a real-time setting. But with this said, though, I mean, there's a lot of jobs that are very sought-after positions that require this. I mean, I think about sports, for example. Now, admittedly, I'm not the biggest sports fan in the world. I just don't follow it. Although, when I went to Purdue, I did go to a lot of football games. Don't really remember a lot of them. You're the quarterback in the middle of the Super Bowl. You know, you throw a long pass. Like, you think that's stressful? People love to romanticize about being a professional sports player. And sure, it has great perks and great pay, and it's honestly a great job. But think about how stressful that is. 
Talk about a real-time, immediate decision that has to be made and think about all the millions of people that are depending on you to not fuck it up. ATC deals with immediate decisions in the immediate moment that require you, the air traffic controller, to apply your knowledge, skills, and abilities to solve the problem. I think that's probably about 60 to 70% of the quote-unquote stress people associate with ATC. The remaining is the fact that air traffic control deals with, well, life and death. This is a serious position. And while it's true that as the modern technology evolves, things like TCAS, you guys may not know about this stuff, but basically things that help the pilots stay safe, the air traffic controller has a major responsibility in keeping life and property safe in the air traffic control system. But I will also say, as I said, not all stress is created equally, and there's certainly truth to that. I mean, think about accounting. So some people would say, well, you know, how stressful could that be? You're sitting in an office and you have time to work on the problems, you look at numbers, you know, you're crunching here and there. But then think about like tax season, or think about being audited, or think about the fact that thousands of people's professions could fall apart if you screw up. Every job and every position requires some level of stress, given. The question is, what is your stress resilience? For most people, I think it's somewhat of an inverted U-curve, where if it's too far on the left, they're bored, they can't really focus, they're kind of like, what am I doing here? And if it's too far to the right, they're anxious, they're overwhelmed, they can't process it, there's too much information being fed into their system, into their brain, they can't keep track of it. The good stress is right in the center of the inverted U-curve, and it's where you're alert, you're focused, There's an amount of information coming in, you're able to process, make decisions, and move on. For some people, they find that air traffic control is the ultimate position that puts them in the zone. And honestly, they have, to them, the best job in the world. The position of the air traffic controller, at least in the US, basically is broken down into three different jobs. You have number one, the tower controllers. These jobs uh, require people to work in a control tower. They're doing clearance delivery. They're telling the planes where they're cleared to fly, essentially, or clearing them on their route. Not gonna get too detailed into how this stuff works. There's plenty of other resources that'll do that. Uh, They also direct the planes on the ground and they direct the planes landing and taking off. The second is what is called a Terminal Radar Approach Facility, or TRACON. Basically, the TRACON guys are radar controllers, they work in a dark room, and they're dealing with more low-level, or quote-unquote, closer to the airport radar. That's kind of a better way to describe it than saying it's dealing with approach and departures, but basically, they're helping planes transition from the ground into their cruise altitude. For those wondering, Pushing Tin, the movie I referenced earlier, that was based on the New York Tracon over here in Westbury, one of the busiest radar facilities in the world, and they deal with all the traffic arriving and departing from the New York metro area, so as you could imagine, it's pretty freaking busy. Finally, the third position, and the one that I came from, is what is known as a center radar, or the air route traffic control centers. There's like 20 to 25 of these around the country, I believe, and they are the bigger air traffic control radar facilities, and these deal with all the high altitude traffic, basically everybody getting into crews, cruising around, and then getting out of crews. One of the interesting things about these center air route traffic control centers, or ARTCCs, is that they're not usually located in big population centers, they're kind of outside of major cities. A good example is Los Angeles Center, which is in Palmdale. Palmdale's out in the high desert. It's pretty far away from the, uh, you know, the metro LA proper area. And out here, actually, I live uh, in Suffolk County, New York. The center here, New York Center, is in Ronkonkoma. Now, back in the day, back in the 50s and 60s, Long Island was mostly rural. It was farms, and it was basically, you know, little suburbia popping up here. Long Island now, it's long gone. Now it's, it's overcrowded and absolutely no longer the case. But it is true that the center is still located in Ronkonkoma, which is about 40 miles to the east of New York City out in Suffolk County, Long Island. Uh, For those wondering why this is, you have to think about the Cold War and what the big fear was back in those days. Of course, we were fearful that the Soviets were going to nuke us. And if you have a bomb go off, especially a nuclear one, well, you're going to have to direct the Air Force, the military. It would not be good if the radar center was located in that city that got bombed. Therefore, they are outside of the city limits. And to this day, that's where they're all still located. Sometimes people say, you know, I love video games, I love radar. How do I get into a radar center? I don't want to work in this, you know, weird-looking tower thing. You don't have much say in that. Furthermore, 
On top of the fact that the facilities are broken up into different classes like tower, tracon, and center, they're also broken down into their complexity level, which is considered to be the level of traffic. Now the numbers go from 0 to 12. I think actually the lowest level is a 4 or a 5. Don't quote me on that, but uh, that's probably about the lowest you'll see. And the highest is a 12 out of 12. So the most complex, most quote unquote difficult, the most uh, heavy traffic, you're going to be finding at level 12 facilities. So think of uh, the New York Tracon that I mentioned, the SoCal Tracon, which deals with uh, Los Angeles traffic. Think about Atlanta Tower. Think about uh, JFK Tower. These are really busy facilities that deal with the most complex situations and the most constant traffic that one would find in the air traffic control profession. For the level four, five, and six towers, you're dealing with facilities that are, are perhaps not known for their heavy traffic. Maybe they're even, uh, you know, they close at night, for example. They're not 24 hours. But you're dealing with things that are just of a different class. They might be more GA-based airports. They might be more community-based. They're not, you know, heavy international ports of entry. They're not major radar facilities. Of course, there's also mid-level ones, seven, eights, and nines, and you know, like uh, for good examples, like Pittsburgh and Albany and uh, you know Cleveland, and these are these are airports that get busy, no doubt, but they're not at the same level of say JFK or LAX. Another thing too is sometimes these facilities are what are called up-down facilities, and so in that case, the controllers are certified in the tower as well as the tracon. So you actually get to do tower and you get to work in the radar room. Where I grew up in Albany, New York, this is the case where the tower controllers actually work in the tower cab. They're doing ground control. They're doing local control, which is clear to take off, clear to land. But then they're also in the base of the tower. Literally, it's a separate, uh, well, it's like a separate room. It's the same building, but they work the radar. So kind of an interesting setup. A lot of people love that idea because you get really the best of both worlds. People always ask about pay and air traffic control because ATC is actually well known for being a high paying position. And it is, especially for the credentials required. You don't need a degree. And many people make six figures in this field. Well, first, it depends on the complexity of where you work. So if you work at a level 12 facility, you're going to be getting higher pay than if you work at a level 5. It also depends on where you live, the cost of living adjustment, which is spelled out very clearly on the federal pay bans. You guys can Google that stuff. I'm sure it's available for you to look up. But suffice it to say, there are a few factors at work in determining how you're paid. There's also differentials. So you're working nights, you're working weekends, holidays, etc., overtime. Overtime is big. There are a lot of facilities right now that are hurting for people badly. I know people personally who are working like six day weeks. They're making bank, but again, it's a tough position. As you go through training, you will get bumped in your pay. You start at what is called AG pay, which is an academy graduate. I'm going to be talking about the academy next. But you start with AG pay, and then you usually go D1, which is developmental one, D2, developmental two, D3, and then CPC, which is Certified Professional Controller, or sometimes they call uh, FPL, Full Performance Level. It's the same thing. Now, not all facilities do that, by the way. Sometimes you do AG pay to, let's say, D1, and then you jump to CPC once you certify. Or sometimes you go from AG pay, you jump to D3 once you certify. It all depends on the complexity of where you're working and certifying. So for example, sometimes you have, let's say, six or seven radar sectors you have to certify on. It's going to take a long time to get through all those. But as you progress and certify in one, certify in the other, you'll get bumped in pay. And by the way, that's how this works because all facilities are going to have multiple positions. So when you get in the door, you start training on one position. As you certify from that one and move to the next one, move to the next one, you'll be bumped up in pay accordingly depending on your local facility. A good example, let's take for example if you worked at a center, you first get to the center and you'll be training on what is called D position, which is the assistant position for let's call it sector one. You certify in sector one, then sector two, three, and four, and then you have all your assistant positions covered for those four sectors. But then after you're done with your assistant training, you would become a quote radar controller. And that's, as far as I know, that's the way it still works for most of these facilities that are centers. You're basically training first as a quote unquote radar assistant where you're helping the radar controller certify all that stuff. And then you're gonna become a real radar controller and you certify again, one, two, three, four, whatever sectors there are. And as you do that, you're getting bumped up in pay. 
I should note, by the way, too, that centers in some of the Tracons, they are broken down into what is called area of specialty. So you'll get to the center, but you're not working every position in the building, because in some cases there's like a hundred. You're actually working maybe a, a set five or six positions, and that is your area of specialty. A lot of times they're called area A, area one, area 12, you know. And so you are assigned that as your, as your job in that building. And once you're certified in every position in your area or in your facility, if it's a smaller one like a tower, then you're good. Then you're a CPC, go out and celebrate because you've accomplished something that many people cannot do. So to tie it back, how do I get into this stuff? How do I apply? I'm really, really turned on by this idea. It just sounds so cool to me. Yes. Now's your time to apply, or should I say in January, January 24th, 2020, you're going to be applying on usajobs.gov, and if you're picked, you will be sent to Oklahoma City for, it's usually between 6 to 12 weeks, depending on where you're going, again, a tower, a tracon, or a center, and then you are assigned your facility and sent out to go train on the job. There are numerous questions about time frame. People always want to know, you know, I applied in January, when do I get picked? It, you know, it could be a week, it could be a year, it could be two years. It's a long process for many people, but don't lose hope. Just continue to educate yourself on the career and on the industry. But let's talk about the minimum requirements. So this is actually from FAA.gov and this is updated as of uh, October. The minimum requirements to be an air traffic control specialist in the U.S. are number one, to be a U.S. citizen, two, be age 30 or under on the closing date of the application period. This is a big one. Many people ask, you know, I'm 31, 32, is it too late? Short answer, yes. There's not much you can do. The exceptions apply to people who are perhaps ex-military, perhaps they've been involved before with air traffic control or the FAA, but very rarely do people get granted exceptions to that rule, unfortunately. So be age 30 or under. Three, this is a big one as well, pass a medical examination. So you're going to be giving a physical, you're going to be given a psych eval. Well, it's not entirely an eval, but you're given an MMPI, which is a basically a uh, inventory test to see how you are mentally. And for most people, it's not a big deal to pass a medical, but there are some criteria you should be aware of. So for example, things like hearing, things like colorblindness, things like medications. There are a ton of medications that are prohibited from being taken while you're an air traffic controller. So if you're on any medication, if you have any past medical problems, do your due diligence and look up to see if it's disqualifying. I cannot harp on this enough because I've gotten so many people who over the years have asked me like, hey man, you know, I have uh, diabetes, I have colorblindness, I have whatever it may be. I mean, look up and if you need real help, what I would recommend doing is calling a, uh, an aviation air medical examiner or call the flight surgeon, you know, email somebody. There would be nothing worse than getting through all this shit and then finding out that you're not qualified. And unfortunately, that happens a lot. You're gonna have to not surprisingly pass a background investigation. Most people, this is not a big deal, but for some, they do have legitimate concerns. Sometimes, for example, people may ask about a crime or some sort of traffic infraction they had when they were 20 years old, and they're like, will this affect me, you know? The answer is maybe, you know? Again, I think it's important to just always be honest with these background checks, never lie in an application, never make shit up, just go with what they're asking. And if you have any legitimate questions, again, I encourage you to find out before you apply and before you put all your eggs into one basket, whether or not you think it's gonna affect you. For a great resource, by the way, Anonymous, I actually recommend Reddit. Uh, you guys can go to reddit.com slant r slant ATC, post in there. There's people who are uh, very helpful. They're sometimes entertaining, but the information you'll get there will be very helpful for you and your journey. So I highly recommend doing that. Pass the FAA air traffic pre-employment test. And this has kind of evolved over the years. When I took it, it was called the ATSAT. I don't even know what it is now, but essentially it's a test that's supposed to grade your mental ability to do the job. People have asked over the years, how do I study for it? There are test prep guides online. You guys can type in ATSAT. Again, I know it's been updated, so do your work, look up what's required with this stuff, but mostly it's not really stuff you're gonna be able to study for. It's basically just like, you know, how to read a graph how to do basic math, how to do, you know, spatial awareness. There used to be a really famous uh, game called Letter Factory. Oh my God. People watching this who know what Letter Factory is, God help us. God help us.
Another big one, have three years of progressively responsible work experience or a bachelor's degree or a combination of post-secondary education and work experience that totals three years. So it's like you don't need a degree, but they're saying it may help. But most importantly, have work experience that's consecutive over a few years. In this case, notably, three years work experience. And finally, be willing to relocate to an FAA facility based on agency staffing needs. And of course, this is what I described earlier. You really can't pick where you're going to end up. But for most people, because of the fact that they need people really badly, just keep an open mind. You know, you may eventually get to where you want to go. For those wondering, the mean wage for air traffic control specialists was $127,805, and that was in 2016. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's gone up since then. But again, it does depend on where you get assigned, the complexity of the facility, where you're working, and also where you are in training. And then once you hit that CPC or FPL level, you are officially an air traffic controller. So if you're interested, bookmark usajobs.gov, check back on January 24th, and apply. I highly recommend people do it. The job is not for everybody. The job is not uh, without its stress. Training is tough. It varies depending on your facility and it also, like I said, varies depending on you as an individual and how well you absorb information and how you learn. I hope to actually make some more videos describing what the training entails. I think that that would be really helpful and a number of people have asked me to do that. But for this video, I just wanted to give you sort of a rundown as to what it is and what it means and how you can apply to be an air traffic control specialist here in the U.S. So for those interested and for those who are going to be applying, I wish you luck. If you have any questions, again, you can always email me, lo at aviationlowdown.com. You can always message me here or check out my Instagram, lo altitude. Again, I don't claim to be an expert in all this stuff far from it, but I do have some experience that can help me shed some light onto this really exciting career and hopefully encourage you, if you're interested, to go apply and see if you have what it takes. As always, guys, thanks for watching. If you like this, please subscribe. Take care and best of luck.